Welcome to On The Spot, special edition here at Freightways Live. We are live, let's give it up for On The Spot. Yay. So with me today is JP Hampstead and Pleasure Zach Strickland. Hello. So On The Spot is our weekly rundown of the freight market where we talk about what's happening, what's hot, what's not, and what, what's going on, JP? Um, it's, you know, I think the story is very similar to last week in terms of rate movements, right? We know we're in a down market. We know we're in a low vol environment. Rates are somewhat predictable, uh, hovering kind of around carrier operating costs. But I had some really interesting conversations with freight brokers, you know, yesterday and today, and people are kind of getting a little gritty, I think, kind of digging in their heels. Um, th their customers are actively trying to claw back everything they gave up in 2018. But I talked to brokers, and these are brokers who are still in growth mode, still committed to you know, taking wallet share, who said, look, we're not gonna give away margins. We're not gonna price freight to lose money. We're gonna commit to a, a rate that we can honor for our whole year. That that's doesn't what we do. work. Like, I don't, I'm calling bullshit. And the reason I'm calling bullshit on that <laughs> okay. is that at some point, volume's going to matter. Vo they'll say that, but when it actually comes to what happens when oh. doors are closed, it's like what you say you'll do until you actually are tempted. That's sort of the official line. We're not going to negotiate on price. It's bullshit. Yeah, it will. never holds. Yeah, you will. I, we, we used to have this happen all Wait, the time. you would hold the line on price? No, never. No, <laughs> never. It's like, I'm not going to do these things until you find out your next competitor is. Freight no, moves freight. And I think that's it's, true, though. Yeah, I mean, okay, I, I see your point. So, like, anyone with a growth mandate, whether you are using asset-based lending, whether you're PE-backed, whether you're VC-backed, you have to grow volumes. Okay, point, let me, right? let me add, give me your perspective. If you have a client that is 10% of your business, so let's say you're a billion dollar company and you have a client that's hundred million dollars, which if you're in trucking, that's quite possible. And they tell you that you're gonna lose the business to a new upstart, to a company that is new in the routing guide. If you don't negotiate on price, you're telling me that you're gonna tell them you're gonna hold the line on price? I'm calling bullshit on you. They're gonna try. I mean, well, you, you were in pricing. Yeah, I did it Your for a long time. Your largest client, you, you worked at Express Global. Home yep. Depot was like a third of your business. Yes. We, we called when it Home back Depot to a came and said, we're not giving you a rate increase. In fact, we want you to take a 3 to 5% rate decrease. Did you take the rate, de the rate decrease in a market like this? Absolutely. Home, Home like Depot, that's, it, it, that, that's but you, more than 10% of their business, right? That was huge. Okay, that's a start. Huge. But, 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 but go back to any major customer. And if you're a $5 million company, a company that does a million dollars in revenue to you is as significant as what Home Depot was and frankly, maybe more important. Companies don't hold the line in price no, in a market like this. They can say that, it sounds great, but do you actually think when it comes down to pricing and those customers are like, hey, this is the price that they're not going to negotiate? I think the distinction though is that some people will lose money on certain lanes and some people won't. And everyone has to know like what makes sense for them. Everyone has to know their customer, and you know just know what their sort of how skilled their buyers are and what, what they can get in the market. I mean, I, I not every, the, you can't. I mean, not like everyone. it sounds great in print, JP. Like that's great in theory. <laughs> how much freight have you bid? Like <laughs> really? <laughs> I'm in a feisty mood. Yeah. I'm tired. <laughs> I'm ready to fight. I'm just saying it's great in theory, Zach. What about you? Yeah, I mean, everybody in these markets, carriers get desperate. I mean, the freight moves freight is the common saying, and... You're gonna take a rate, you're, you're gonna take, if your customer puts it to you and says, I have a digital upstart that I'm gonna give this business to, name it, Uber Freight, Convoy, JB Hunt 360, and they're using that as competition, do you, are you going to walk away from the business? We, I will say this, we have done that, we have, essentially fired business, but it wasn't necessarily because 
Thank you, Zach. We were trying to <laughs> hold the line. JP feels attacked up here. Yeah, I yeah. love you, JP. We, <laughs> you, you are, you're yeah, one of the right on top of people it. I know. Also, there are different kinds of customers. Some customers care way more about price than others. I mean, I can think of you know, a very large water company that um, really needs to move what is essentially a free commodity very cheaply. Other companies um, that move other kinds of products care far more about service. Well, I think I say, wa I mean, water is an interesting commodity in itself and freight because certain times of the year they'll pay rock bottom prices, mm -hmm. like 90%, like from, right. from Q4, Q1. September to May. It's one of the worst customers you can possibly have is moving beverages, liquid. But from May to September, they pay some of the highest rates. Mm -hmm. It's not all, it's not one direction. It depends on what's happening. I made a lot of money moving bottled water and beer <laughs> in the summer. You make not, and they were buying XT, yep. 600 loads. Yeah. Three, three dollars a mile, five dollars a mile, whatever, because the cost of not having that in stock far outweighed the- The expenditure to get it there. It. Yeah. So, okay. We, He's like you think losing we, his train of thought. No, we think we're in the middle. We're in the middle. Somewhere of in season, St. Louis, right? People, people are sort of in this fierce competition. You say it's sort of all about price. Do you think um, that any, you see anything that can change that that narrative? Anything that uh, you know leads us to sort of a different kind of market? No, in not the right now. In the not, right now. not in the sluggishness of the freight demand that we are seeing right now. Why? There is no ex. There's tons of excess capacity. Right. And right now, volumes are, uh, you know, in sonar, if you look at otviy.usa, which is um, outbound tender volume index yearly change, it's negative 2.5%. Which was weird because if we go back two months ago, it was actually ahead of 2000. Yeah, it just it just changed this week, actually. Yeah. Like we and fell it's right down, it. which it's is down. scary. So what do you think is happening? So a lot of those volumes uh, that we saw throughout the year, a lot of the trade war impact, so we had a bunch of imports coming into the ports. We've seen escalated uh, volumes out of Elizabeth, New Jersey, Savannah, Los Angeles. A lot of these movements were all regional moves. So they basically pulled all this stuff in, crammed it into a warehouse, and now they're basically done. They've pulled everything in, they've positioned their freight where they need to move it for the most part, and now they have probably excess supply in these warehouses. And you're saying, Zach, before we, we started filming this, that a lot of the sort of uh, you know year over year negative trend that w that we just entered is due to you know sort of really bad softness in Southern California, LA, yeah. and Ontario. What, what about other port cities and sort of inland port cities? What about like Chicago, Memphis? Yeah, so Chicago still pretty soft year over year. We're still down, but it's getting better. They're getting better comps, uh, but the port city like Elizabeth, New Jersey, it's still. It's still overheated. I mean, it's still really active. And again, this time of year is when we see all these imports come in and they go to their warehouses, the DCs, and that's keeping the East Coast relatively active in relation to the West Coast. And the West Coast, all those long haul moves, they've already moved and a lot of that transitioning from uh, the ports coming across, you know, the Suez Canal versus uh, Panama. Do you think also because of the proximity to like, uh, you know, large concentrations of consumers, does like, e do East Coast ports stay active longer going into retail season than West Coast ports? Yeah, because they have a better time. I mean, they have it more time. I mean, does that, ha does yeah. that happen in the data yeah. though? They yeah. don't have the, the need to move it. I mean, the thing, if you think about like West Coast, moving freight into West Coast, a large percent of the consumption even freight moving to the West Coast doesn't actually get consumed to the West Coast. They have to move it inland. Mm -hmm. And so while you may have a ton of container movements into the West Coast, a lot of that freight is getting intermodaled or trucked to other parts of the country. Whereas on the East Coast, you're going to keep it in your warehouses until you have the consumption cycle. Well, they're set up so they're right a little there. bit later. I mean, we're right now, we're, we're at, if you don't have it into your final DC, chances are you're not going to meet retail. Like right. it, it should be in your distribution centers at this point. And, and there, I, there are I, some exceptions to that in certain types of commodities, but right now this is this is near the end of the peak. Yep. Do you think that people? Uh, do you think any shippers will sort of take advantage in like slack air freight rates? Um, yeah. If you have commodities that, I, I think they'll take advantage if they have regular movements where they they're trying to optimize cost. But I, I think. You don't want to sit on inventory. There's a lot, like, we, we're in end of the year. There's actually a lot of game and ship in freight and transit. So you actually see people put stuff in transit just for tax of tax avoidance strategies because 
there are different states. I know in the state of Texas, if you have stuff in inventory, you have to pay taxes. Yep. You actually see a lot of demand for trucking services to put them on trailers just to avoid the tax overhang. Wow. Because you, you, you have the inventory had tax they, issue. The, are, there's like, are those like tendered loads? Yeah they'll, ten, yeah, they'll tender them and they'll do it at the end of the year. They'll tender them on trailers and they'll sit until after the new year so they don't have to have it as an inventory. It's in transit. And they'll be between. It's a, it's a lot of game and ship that happens at the end of the year. That's interesting. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I mean, some of the stuff that happens in freight is not necessarily... <laughs> has nothing to do <laughs> yeah. with the market. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was actually intrigued by something that uh, Shelly Simpson said on stage uh, earlier today during her keynote, which I thought was amazing and actually inspiring. But... One of the things that, one of J.B. Hunt's big bets is that they can convince shippers to move an additional 7 to 11 million loads per year from the highway to intermodal. And now, like, we think, and, and most, I think, you know, equities analysts or whatever think that the railroads have pretty much finished uh, rationalizing intermodal lanes. They finished demarketing uh, the lanes where they didn't have density and they didn't have, you know, juicy enough margins. Um, do you think, like, a shift of that size, like, is 2020 a year where that can happen? What does that do to intermodal? What does that do to sort of the competition between trucking I, and intermodal? It's interesting because I think, you know, if you look at J.B. Hunt's customers, it's actually a relatively small list of customers. They have a lot of really big shippers. They don't, they haven't, you know, intermodal itself, getting access to intermodal, has traditionally not been available in mass for the long tail. They're at, as a small shipper, it has historically been difficult to get access to intermodal capacity. That, I think, with, with JB Hunt 360 and other f forms of the way they're rethinking about their mode agnostic network, the box, et cetera, they're able to democratize that ability to get into some of the smaller shippers. And they've never really gone out and marketed small shippers. I mean, if you listen to Shelly herself will say this, is when they walk into shippers, there are companies like Sage Robinson may be far more ubiquitous in terms of distribution. J.B. Hunt actually has a lot of really big shippers. They have not historically gone after the long tail, but I think that's shifting. Do you think, like, you know, Schneider, Hub, um, Swift, do you think they kind of respond to this and, and sort of lean aggressively into intermodal? I think every company, I think we're entering a cycle where mode agnosticity is far more important. If you go back, and Zach, you, when you and I were <laughs> routing freight, right? Uh, it was sort of in the early days of trailer on flat car yeah. where intermodal sort of people didn't want it to move by the train because they're worried about service times or worried about custody and stuff. And that's, that seems to, we've seemed to have gone past those days where that matters, where now it's just about service dependability and cost and price. Yeah. And that's, that's something that the, the intermodal side struggles with is that service dependability aspect of things. I mean, well, especially with, with, uh, <laughs> Precision railroading. Yeah, no, you're you're at the mercy of the rail cars, and they're 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 stacking them up. I mean, we saw intermodal volumes drop still year over year, which is crazy. But intermodal rates increase over the last thirty well, it's days. Because they're they're managing their schedules and what they, capacity they do. And the, there's also a shift. I mean, think about what is the largest commodity outside of intermodal boxes that moves on rail? It's coal. Yep. And it's as dying. Now the question is, well, it is dying. <laughs> the question is going to be around the environmental... I mean, people aren't building coal plants in the U.S., right? No, and not anymore. <laughs> not, not. It's a big CapEx yeah. for very little return. Right. Hmm. Um, that's hmm. interesting. Okay. Uh, but the rails also... I mean, they're, they're an oligopoly, so they, they can control their situation a little bit easier than most of these carriers. Actually, I heard a funny story. Um, I'm not going to talk about who this broker was. It was an asset-based broker, right? They took, they're taught, the story and the sort of the moral of this fable is about how when you move um, loads by intermodal, you actually lose a lot of control over service. You lose a lot of visibility. And it was an asset-based uh, brokerage who was moving a load for a very large chemical company. And the chemical company kind of thought this was going to be on one of this carrier's trucks. They brokered it t to a different carrier who then put it on a train. That train ends up getting hit by a tornado and, and flipped over. Uh, the fire marshal comes, calls the chemical company who has no idea why their stuff is on this train. And it, I just think it's indicative of like sort of, I don't know that those sorts of challenges have been solved. I mean, of course- They haven't, but that, but that you're talking about two different issues. Because one is the issue of routing freight. 
and the other issue is custody of freight and tracking. And that's the argument for visibility. And so at the end of the day as a shipper, do I care what, how that freight has been routed or do I care that I, I know how that freight's routed? And that, that's, we're talking about two separate things. One is I want on-time service at a, an affordable price, but I also want to know where my car goes at. And who's, and who's carrying it. And who's carrying it, because I'm liable. There is now, I mean, we've seen it with brokerages where they're getting called into these nuclear lawsuits because they are caught up where they didn't do proper diligence or could be accused of doing, not doing proper diligence, where they're having to pay out massive claims because they're, they didn't do their job in the eyes of the court. And it's really whoever has the most money. And most days it's the brokerages that have far more money than the truck companies. That's accurate. Interesting. Um, the only other thing I would say about rates is just that we do think, you know, there will be um, sort of temporary anomalies and aberrations if, you know, this winter uh, continues to be kind of cold. crazy, cold, and, and sort of precipitous and uh, disruptive. Those things will pop up. You know, who knows how long uh, those kind of events can last. I remember. Uh, you know, last March when Philadelphia got hit by three nor'easters in a row, caused like a sort of a month-long uh, sort of carrier reluctance to go into those major northeastern markets. Um, I think we'll see a little sort of like pockets of, of tightness and, and, and sort of dangerous conditions and things like that, that that can cause spikes in rates. But, you know, as far as peak season goes, it's not very peaky. No, nah, peak is dead this year. <laughs> like, there is no peak. Getting back to weather, it's sort of the annual first quarter. Weather, we were weather by weather. Yeah, yeah, weather it, messed it's us a up. template. Yeah. Uh, there, we miss our number because of weather. Yeah, you can yeah. just put that in every earnings, earnings call. I'm going to predict every <laughs> single carrier is going to have weather problems in the first quarter. <laughs> they did not, unforeseen right. weather conditions, an unusual item. We should, every we one should of actually them. track that. Like, because I bet you, should, I, you go back to the quarter, the railroads, go back to your, your say earnings calls. The, the trucking carriers. Oh, they always say it. every, every year when there's softness, they come back to weather. And it will be interesting to see if, like, one national enterprise carrier doesn't cite the weather. we be like, wow, they just avoided all the storms. They're going to quote yeah. the weather. <laughs> they, yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. They're going to quote the weather regardless. It doesn't matter if it's soft and or not. It's <laughs> universal. Yeah. Universal. Yeah. It snows in the winter. Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> uh, any any closing thoughts? Is there any sort of uh, you know hope on this you know increasingly? No, I, I will say my leak? my I'm hearing this more and more often. So Convoy announced a 400 million dollar raise. Yes. Big dollars. It's a lot of capital. Uber has is aggressive in terms of price. JB Hunt is growing uh, leaps and bounds. We're, but it's interesting because you talk to some of the larger carriers that have contract rates or committed volume. And what they're seeing, and I'm hearing this from a lot of carriers, is that they're not able to get rate increases, as we talked about when we first started. Correct. And the companies are using, these are national accounts, are using, hey, if you don't give us this rate increase, we're going to go to Convoy, or we're going to go to JB Hunt 360, or we're going to go to Uber Freight. And they're using those as threats, not necessarily because they intend to do it, because they intend to get a lower price. And we go back to the other question that we taught, we started this conversation about if you're left in a situation where you have a significant customer, do you take, do you accept the lower rate or do you walk away from the business? It depends. Zach, what are your closing thoughts? It, it depends on the customer. I mean, the, there are certain customers that obviously carry a lot more weight, and it depends on how diversified you are with your customer base. I mean, if you have a, if you have a lot of customers that are occupying only about 1% to 2% of your overall business, maybe you do take this opportunity to kind of shed some of that weight. I mean, especially if they're not paying you 93 ORs that you want or 95 OR or whatever it is, you, you take some of these opportunities to call them on their threats because this is the only way that you have any leverage. I, Go ahead. I don't, I don't think this, this doesn't happen often, and especially in a down market, <laughs> but it does happen. JP, what do you think? No, um, you know, I think that I agree with Zach. It depends on the customer. It depends on the brokerage. It depends on, you know, what your goals are and what you're trying to accomplish. I mean, I, I keep hearing about uh, large publicly traded transportation companies telling their investors quarter after quarter, we're trying to take market share. I don't necessarily know that the revenue you add in a market like this is high quality revenue. Um, you know, 
I don't know, you know, if if your investors recognize that. Um, I think it's sort of company by company. I, I I will say in this market, they don't walk away from the business, and no. they they ba they walk away from the business when conditions are good. It's when you reset your customer life cycle. You, they need to keep their trucks moving right now. They need to keep the equipment rolling. They need to keep their brokers busy. That's far more important. And if you think about game theory, when things are soft, volume becomes key. Mm -hmm. That is going to be far more important than taking rate increases and trying to manage it. That's my view. We'll see what happens. We'll, we'll continue to stay in tune. And you can tune in each week to On The Spot. This is Zach and JP's show. I crashed the party, and I'm feisty. So I apologize to That's okay, JP. He's one of the get... smartest guys I know. But I have to challenge him, and I was thinking that people are not going to take rate increases. I was, you know, okay, that's that's, that's my enough. view. All right. Well, I'll see you next week, Zach. All right, JP. I'll go so, easier on you. All right, on the spot, tune in each week.